This video was brought to you by Nebula. Yesterday, the UK government announced that it had finally concluded an agreement in principle to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, more commonly known as CPTPP. Now, this is something the Conservatives have been talking about since at least 2018, when then International Trade Secretary Liam Fox started flirting with the idea, and many Brexiteers began pitching it as a partial post-Brexit replacement for the EU single market. So in this video, we're going to take a look at what the CPTPP actually is, why the UK wants to join a free trade area in a region hundreds of miles away in the first place, and whether it's actually a good idea. So, the CPTPP is a massive free trade agreement between Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, Vietnam, and now the UK. The CPTPP, previously known just as the TPP, was first really conceived by Barack Obama back in 2009 as the economic basis for his so-called pivot to Asia. Originally, Obama's plan was to use the CPTPP to create a trade bloc so big that China would eventually be tempted to apply, and then use the subsequent negotiations to pressure the Chinese into agreeing to regulations related to stuff like intellectual property and state-owned enterprises, which are both covered by the CPTPP. For context, the US have long complained that Chinese companies habitually steal intellectual property from American companies, and that Chinese subsidiaries of state-owned companies undercut their American counterparts. However, despite originating with the US and Obama, Trump withdrew America from the bloc just three days after taking office because he believed that free trade agreements were just generally bad for American industry. Regardless, Japan took up the mantle and pushed forward with the agreement anyway, and today, the countries involved in the CPTPP represent about 17% of global GDP, making it one of the largest free trade agreements anywhere in the world, even without American participation. Now, like most trade agreements, the CPTPP facilitates trade between its members by doing two things. Harmonizing certain regulations, and perhaps more importantly, reducing tariffs. That's because there's basically zero tariffs on trade between CPTPP members, with only a few exemptions for sensitive goods. Japan and Canada, for example, both use limited tariffs to protect their rice and dairy industries, respectively. On top of that, the CPTPP provides for a single set of rules of origin, which prevent foreign goods from sneaking into the CPTPP and allows content from all CPTPP countries to be culminated. This basically means that they can qualify for preferential tariffs as long as some fraction of the good is made by a CPTPP company. So, for example, a Japanese car manufacturer is allowed to sell their cars tariff-free to the rest of the CPTPP if at least 45% of the parts come from other countries in the CPTPP. However, what makes the CPTPP so special is its scope. As well as harmonizing SPS regulations and reducing tariffs, the CPTPP also includes chapters on things like labor rights, environmental protections, and state-owned enterprises, as well as a pretty robust enforcement mechanism. Now, these kind of things aren't normally included in most FTAs, especially among developing economies, which makes the CPTPP especially powerful and unique. Anyway, the UK first applied to join the CPTPP back on February 1st, 2021. At the time, the UK government, then led by Boris Johnson, was trying to prove that it could make the most of its new Brexit freedoms, having left the EU a year beforehand. Anyway, accession negotiations began a couple of months later, on June 2nd, and the first phase of negotiations were wrapped up February of last year. Negotiations then accelerated this February, after the UK finalised the new Windsor framework with the EU, which gave CPTPP members more confidence about the UK's commitments to its international obligations. 
And as such, there was some hope that the deal would be finalized when Sunak traveled to Vietnam in early March. Unfortunately, though, this didn't happen, largely because two sticking points remained. Firstly, Canada wanted the UK to drop its ban on hormone-injected beef, which the UK wasn't keen on. And secondly, Canada and Mexico wanted the UK to offer the same single market access on agriculture as it did in its recent trade deals with Australia and New Zealand. But again, the UK resisted. Because while it's true the UK offered nearly unfettered access to Australia and New Zealand, this didn't go down well with British farmers when it was announced. And even former Agriculture Secretary George Eustace has since admitted it was a mistake. So doing the same thing for an even larger market didn't really look palatable for Britain. Fortunately for Sunak, though, it looks like these issues were resolved last week, when the UK's trade minister, Kemi Budnock, met with her Canadian counterpart in London. And as such, yesterday, the UK finally signed off on an agreement. As you'd expect, the government are pretty happy about this. Not only because free trade deals are generally good for an economy, but also because this gives Sunak something to point to when he's asked what the benefits of Brexit has been. However, is this really a benefit of Brexit? How much difference will joining the CPTPP really make? Well, in the short term, the answer is probably not much. Modelling done by the Department for International Trade in 2021 estimated that accession to the CPTPP would increase the UK's annual GDP by just £1.8 billion, which amounts to less than 0.1%. And these forecasts even warned that if more countries were to join the bloc in the future, it could actually have a negative impact on certain sectors of the British economy, most notably farming and processed foods. So why is it that joining the CPTPP will make so little impact, especially when compared to EU membership? Well, it's partly simply because these countries are very far away. So the UK doesn't even ordinarily do that much trade with most of these countries anyway. But it's also because the UK already has free trade agreements with nine of the 11 countries in the bloc, many of which were rolled over from EU free trade agreements, which the UK already had pre-Brexit. Now, while the CPTPP does actually go further than these agreements in most areas, these agreements already cover most of the economically significant measures, like reducing tariffs, which limits the CPTPP's overall impact on GDP. So that makes it harder to justify, say, opening up British farming to further pressure or relaxing rules on palm oil if the CPTPP only increases GDP by less than 0.1% anyway. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad idea. The UK's trade with CPTPP members is growing fast at the moment. From 2016 until the pandemic, UK trade with CPTPP members grew by about 8% a year, and Asia will soon become the world's preeminent consumer market anyway. That's because 65% of the world's 5.4 billion middle-class consumers are expected to be in Asia by 2030, and demand for imports among CPTPP members are projected to increase by nearly 70%. On top of that, while the US might not be keen, the Philippines, Thailand, Taiwan, South Korea, and China have all expressed interest in joining. If that happens, then not only will it massively increase the size of the CPTPP, but it will also give the UK an opportunity to influence global trading rules and norms because any applicant requires unanimous consent from all current CPTPP members. For example, the UK could use its membership of the CPTPP to force China, which formally applied to join in 2021, to sign up to stricter intellectual property rules or environmental regulations. So you get the idea then. While the CPTPP won't immediately transform the UK into an economic powerhouse, it's definitely got potential. And depending on how things unfold, it could be one benefit of Brexit. If that's not enough TLDR for you for one day, then you ought to check out our new series, This Week in Parliament, which has just made a magnificent return. That's not a quote or anything, that's just a thing I'm saying. 
Anyway, This Week in Parliament is a show where we run down exactly what happened in Parliament in the preceding week, breaking down the debates, laws and bills which otherwise you'd have totally missed, and explaining what really happens in Britain's seat of power when you brush aside all of the shouting and arm-waving. New episodes of that come out every week only on Nebula. But that's not all. There's also the extended version of the daily briefing every single weekday, a bunch of exclusive explainer videos, some totally silly fun content, and all of our videos totally ad-free. And it's not just TLDR either. We're joined by a whole bunch of your favorite creators, from Wendover and Real Life Law to Johnny Harris. Which means that on Nebula, there's a whole ton of exclusive videos, early access to loads of creators, and all of the ad-free viewing you could possibly handle. And signing up using our link gets you access for just $2.50 a month. Not only that, this is the absolute best way you can support the channel. So thanks for watching and we'll see you soon on Nebula.